computer audio or something like that. That way we can hear it. Thanks. Oh, you have to do that separately? Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, it comes yeah, up when, at the bottom somewhere. In the, in the little prompt where you share your screen, it has the little check boxes underneath that says so something like uh, optimize video for uh, streaming and uh, share computer audio. Share computer well, audio, yeah. So you do share share uh, computer sound. Yeah, where it says share screen, when, you, when he clicks on it, he can something will come up and they can say share computer sound. And you might as well do optimize screen for video clip if you're doing that. Yeah, that's true. Okay, cool. Yeah, I see it. You can bring it up without actually requesting um, control. Huh. Oh, I think we lost Oscar. <laughs> oh, no. All right, you should. He, he probably click on the X and exit it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah. Too many rules, too complicated. I'm back to roboting. There he yeah, is. Yeah, he'll be back. There he is. Sorry, my computer. I don't know. Something happens. Okay, I, I will start. The floor is yours. Okay. Now, can you see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the problem that uh, we uh, addressed was to move boxes uh, with a set of uh, robots. So what, what was the goal of this? The goal is that some of the robots, so some of them uh, here, move all the way till I reach the box, and then the box, uh, we move it somewhere inside this um, part, right, on, on the side of the robots. Okay, so for the initial setting, the boxes have IDs, right? We use arrow code for this. And then robots need to detect this. We send the number. We can have many different boxes. And we send the, the ID of the box that we want to, to move. Okay, so that's the main idea. And the idea is to use the minimum number of robots that are able to push uh, the box. Okay, so there is a little bit of optimization part here. Okay, so how to solve this problem? So what we did is uh, first to create primitives for uh, the robots, right? Before uh, be able to uh, collaborate, they, uh, they it, it needs to solve primitives. So what are these primitives? So what I know with primitives is that uh, the robots will rotate, right? And they don't have uh, actually a GPA or anything similar, so they don't know where they are. They don't have a compass. However, they have um, a gyroscope, accelerometer, so we can uh, decide the uh, rotation. Okay, uh, well, uh, yeah, so, uh, later I will talk a little bit about the uh, architecture of the robot. So the primitives goes like this. So one of the primitives is, is that the robots rotate till actually uh, they find the, the QR code that they are looking for, right? Once they find this, they need to align according to, to the uh, uh, normal, right? So you can think that there is a normal here and then our robots need to um, uh, align according to this normal. So they can go exactly in front and stay in line. Okay, so that I can call the uh, scanning uh, 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 protocol. Okay, so I will move one. So I have different primitives here. So these primitives, uh, what we can do is to describe first this. So I, I can also create a program for this. Right, so scanning. It accepts a parameter J, that is the box that we are searching for, right? And uh, what it does is to uh, rotate until uh, it aligns with the box, the box J. Okay, if they don't find the box, they are just rotating, 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 okay? And another thing is uh, we can, um, okay, no, it's okay. 
So that's the, uh, the, the uh, semantics for this primitive, okay? Another primitive, okay, I have the architecture here, so maybe I should go first with the architecture and then I can uh, move uh, to the uh, 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 primitives. So let me move uh, the, this here, okay. So what are the, the architecture of the robot? So we have, on this part, I have here, here, and on the other side, these are laser, laser uh, distance sensors, based on laser. All right, uh, we have the wheels, these are uh, omni wheels, or um, uh, mechanium wheels. We can call it just omni wheels. Omni uh, wheels. So these uh, omni wheels allow the robot to move in uh, whatever direction. You don't need to rotate to move uh, left or right, okay? And then uh, we have here a Raspberry Pi camera. Okay, and then uh, this is a Jetson. Jetson Nano. Okay, so Jetson Nano is like uh, uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi, but much more powerful, right? We have a few hundreds of uh, GPUs, so you can do some machine learning, right? And then I have here, well, this is just normal uh, Wi-Fi, right? Uh, then I have here uh, an Arduino. The Arduino Nano connects, uh, is the one that is reading the distance sensors. Okay, and then these distance sensors connect to the Jetson uh, through a uh, normal serial, USB. The uh, Jetson uh, computes it, uh, sends back to this part that I call the autopilot. Right? This is something that we design at home. I will show in uh, below this part. And another part here is this. This is called the flow deck. So the flow deck, what it does is like the mouse. When you move the mouse, uh, it detects the uh, distance, X and Y, right? The difference within uh, two different frames. And that you can translate to, uh, to, to uh, uh, speed. Right, so we can detect the speed, we can detect uh, uh, how much it has moved. Okay, so the autopilot is this, it's actually uh, being helped to uh, solder these parts. So what do we have here? This is a, a Tinsy a 3.2. So you know it's an ARM processor, it's quite powerful. And then I have here uh, this, uh, it's for the uh, wireless communication. It's a Bluetooth. It's an NRF. I don't remember the number. NRF eight one uh, something. I don't remember. I think it's something like this. So this we also modify and we implement our own algorithm inside this, so we can communicate faster. Okay, and then uh, with this, I move the motors. Uh, oh no, just with this. These are to f f to control the actuators. Okay, uh, this is for the, um, uh, yeah, this is for the flow deck, where I connect the flow deck. And then this is for the MPU, right, the gyroscope. Or actually, IMU. Okay, uh, so that's in general the architecture. Then uh, the TNC connects to the jet, so with the serials, so it can transmit to the jet zone uh, the, uh, some information at the position, uh, many other things. And uh, the jet zone also communicates. So it's a runway, right, communication. Uh, the jet zone is sending back, uh, for example, the operator, the uh, box that we want to move. It also sends back the uh, readings of the distance sensor which is not connecting uh, with this because I didn't have enough uh, pins, right? So the idea now is to move to a bigger uh, Tinsy, the 
uh, I think six, that has much more uh, pins. So in the future, we want to put it in, in only one. But for this um, uh, project, this project was for aerospace, by the way. Uh, they uh, give a small grant for for implementing this, and we were we were in rush, so we didn't um, uh, modify this. But I think we already have the new design that we can start doing as soon as the uh, school is open again. Uh, this I, I'm not using, but well, this is an. Uh, uh, it's uh, how they call it. It's, um, it's communication module, uh, but it uses low frequency, so you you can uh, locate yourself in in indoor. Right? So it's like a, a, a GPS indoor. We are not using this, right? so I'm not. Uh, consider this part. Okay, so that's the architecture. So now with this robot, we want to move the boxes. So as, as I said before, we have primitives. Uh -huh. the, it, first, let's solve primitives, and later we can combine these primitives to solve the problem, okay? And the first primitive that I mentioned was the scan, or scanning, right? So the scanning, they are just rotating. When they find it, they align. And a second, um, a second, um, a, a primitive is to move a, either of, of these uh, uh, robots. So I move to get closer and then I will traverse to the back part of the box and I uh, start, uh, uh, wait there, right? So, so this moves here and then traverse the box it's here. At this moment, this is the, uh, what I want to finish on my uh, primitive. Okay, so essentially what I need is to take this robot. It will move all the way, be here, then go all the way around. It rotates, it measures the box. They don't know anything about the box, right? And then it stays here. Okay, that's a primitive. Okay, uh, no, actually I'm combining two primitives. <laughs> okay, one primitive is uh, the one that goes from, from here to here. I will call this approach, approach, right? So this is uh, RI, uh, let's say the robot RI moves to reach a uh, box J. Okay, and then uh, we can start thinking about uh, prerequisites. So uh, only one can move. At, this, at the time, right? If uh, two of them move at the time, they may crash in within, okay? So we need to fix this. And the one that goes is according to this. So let's, let me return the uh, robot to the original position. So it was here. So the, the, re, rob, uh, the, the first robot that goes is the one that is closest, okay? So therefore, they also are, uh, 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 measuring the distance to the box, right? So after the scanning, they have uh, uh, some values. So it says here, it calculates, of course, it's an approximation, it says that it's a distance x, x1, right? And then this is a distance x2, and then this is a distance x3, a distance x4. Okay, so now the one that is the closest is the one that goes first, right? So we have this rank, that uh, will uh, it will work like a, a, a semaphore that, that allows exactly one to move. Okay. Okay. So again, this is just go here and here. Okay. So uh, moves R I moves to reach box J, and uh, we can also start enumerating box uh, the the faces of the box. So I will call this phase zero, phase uh, uh, one, phase two, and phase three. Right, so I can do for all of them. So the uh, primitive will uh, move to reach box J at, uh, at uh, phase zero. Okay. Now another uh, primitive is once the robot is over there, that's the one that I combined, so it's here. It will move around, measure the box, 
if it's the first robot, return to the center, position in, in, the, in the center, and then, and then stop. Right? And then there is another uh, primitive. So this moves here, goes here, measure the box. Okay, but this time it has rotating and it position here. Okay, so that's I will call a uh, chain phase. Okay, so I have the uh, method here, chain phase. And then I, I can give here, to make it more uh, general, I can give you a parameter F prime. So what it means is that it will traverse F uh, prime minus one phase. Okay, so again, if the phase is like this, uh, the robot is positioning on this phase, right? If I give one, then it will go clockwise and I, it will just position in here. If I give you two, it will go all this phase then I move in this direction and position in, in this. If I give you uh, two, it will go to the back, right? And I can also give a minus one. So if I give minus one, it will go in this direction. If I give minus two, it goes in this direction. So now uh, with this primitive, I can traverse the phase in uh, any order, right? uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. So I can just layer this. Okay, so traverse. Yes. Hey, Dr. Morales, uh, yes. a couple of questions about that. Probably the easiest one is, um, how are you circumnavigating the box? Are you just kind of like wall following and- Yes, and uh, with the top? distance sensors. Uh, with, with the distance sensors, first I check uh, the previous uh, primitives. Um, uh, okay, the, the, the output of the, of the approach is to let the robot, to, to position the robot a distance, let's say, y from uh, the box, okay? And for that, I'm using the distance sensors. And now from these distance sensors, uh, the robot can walk uh, sideways without uh, rotating. So it will always face the box and with the distance sensors, it maintains the distance. Okay? Of course, there is a problem when uh, the robot reaches exactly uh, this point, right? When the distance sensor doesn't measure anything. That's what, what I know that we have finished. So I can, uh, with the, uh, uh, the flow deck, I can let the robot to move a little bit more, right? So uh, we have like uh, centimeters. We can uh, give instruction to the robot to move 20 centimeters. So I will just give extra 20 centimeters and it stops and then rotates and then it continue moving always facing to the, uh, uh, to the face of the box. Is that fine? Cool, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I hope we have time to reach this. Uh, I mean the video that actually shows all of this. Okay, so traverse is, this is what it does. So this traverse F and uh, and uh, and uh, position. Okay, it is a little bit more difficult than this. Position the robot. I will just put it at the right place. Uh, here we need some mats, uh, right? Because if it's in the center, I mean, if it's the first robot, it's in the center. If I have two robots, then one goes a little bit to the left and the other goes to the right. So now uh, the index of the robot, the, the um, rank that I mentioned before, plays a, a role. Okay, so I will just undo it like this. Okay, another uh, uh, primitive that I have, so this will allow me to, to the robot to put it here. So if I can, I can, it, it, it will try to push, right? If it cannot push because the uh, box is too uh, heavy. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, if it's too heavy, it will uh, relocate. So relocate means it will make a space for the other robot to join. So it will move to one direction. Okay, uh, let me see how I call it here. Um, yeah, so I will just put it in relocate. 
leave a space for another robot. Hey, Dr. Brella, sorry to keep um, peppering you with questions, but this is just so cool. How does your robot know if it is able to nudge the box or not? Uh, okay, the, that's in the push part. So it will try to push. We have this odometer with the uh, flow day. So they detect how much they have moved. So you can let the robot push for, let's say, uh, half a second or a second. If it cannot, either because it will spin, the wheels will be spinning without actually moving. So the flow deck will uh, uh, return that it hasn't moved. At that moment, we know that we have moved the box or we have it, right? So it's a, a simple test. Cool. Okay. So actually, that's the next primitive, the push. Okay, uh, push here. So push, I will try um, try to push for some distance, right? So I can put it there. If it can, great. If it cannot, then it will ask for help. Okay. Okay. So we have five uh, simple primitives. Not simple, actually. These are difficult. It was kind of difficult, especially the approach. No, the approach was simple. The more difficult here was chain phase. That, that was really difficult. There are a lot of issues uh, that uh, uh, you don't see it immediately. Right? We always assume that it's fine, but the fact that uh, uh, we don't see the, where the robot is uh, really affects. It's just uh, adding something, but if you pass, then you, uh, you may miss the box when you rotate and you cannot find the box again. So it, that was the most difficult part. Okay, so now once we have all of these, we need to combine. We need to combine in an algorithm. Right, the, that would be the uh, cooperative algorithm. So, okay, so this is a state machine. Uh, actually, the, the uh, whole uh, algorithm is in a, something called time input output automaton. So it's an automaton. It's a state machine, but also considers time. Uh, uh, time is another variable that we can control. Okay, so let, let me try to explain a little bit this. As it's not so difficult to understand. So at the beginning, we are here. So the uh, user, the operator, gives J. J is the box. So we detect. When J is greater than zero, that means that we need to move to, uh, to push the box. Right? So at that moment, we move to the state scan. So in a scan, the robots are executing the primitive that I just discussed, right? And then how do they know that they have finished? Well, I need to check this distance, right? The distance that exists from the robot to the box. If it's equal to zero, that means that I haven't found, right? Uh, if, but if it's greater than zero, that means that I have seen the box, okay? And then, uh, with the primitive, we need to ensure that it's always aligned, right? That's something important to denote or to um, specify in the primitives, what is the prerequisites and what are the effects, right? What is gonna be the output that we are expected at the end? Okay, so once uh, the distance is greater than zero, that means that we can see the, the box, then they start broadcasting. This is broadcasting. So they are broadcasting the distance that they have seen to the box. Remember that I am talking about the rank, right? The, the, the closest one is the one that, that has the highest rank, or actually the rank is one, right? And then the second uh, closest rank two and so on. But to know that, we need to make sure that everybody knows the same thing, right? That's um, in a previous talk, I talked about this. That's the consensus protocol, right? And that's, uh, most of the time works, but we need to be careful because no matter what uh, um, uh, hardware you are using and software, there is going to be always a problem, right? So eventually you will find this problem. Okay, so they are broadcasting. 
uh, they detect the number of robots. Uh, it's called membership uh, service. So everybody is transmitting infinitely often uh, their state and some other things. So using that, they put it into a membership uh, uh, list. So they know. Okay, anyway. So here they are checking if exists one robot and that the distance is equal to zero, that means that it's still in this in this state, right? Uh, so we need to wait. We we continue in this state. So everybody is in this state. Finally, the other finish, and now the distance is greater than uh, zero, so they can compute the rank. But we cannot compute before the rank because if we do, if we did, uh, if we uh, compute the rank before and we start moving, and then the other arise and compute the rank, which is the same rank, they will go together and it, they may crash, right? So we need to avoid that. So, okay, so that's why we are waiting here. Okay, now when everybody has the rank, then they move to the approach part. Okay, remember in the approach, what we say is that only the, uh, yeah, so only the, the robot with the smallest rank is the one that goes, the closest one, right? So if you have a rank greater than active, active becomes one at that moment because there is exactly one robot that is moving, okay? So that means that a, a rank two will weigh rank three, rank four, but rank one is here, right? It's, it's the one that is executing the approaching, it's moving, getting closer. Once it reaches the front of the box, it, uh, it start moving, uh, it's the preparing, which, which uh, what it does is chain phase, right? With this chain phase, uh, it will prepare, it will locate in the center of the box. So it will move to this uh, box uh, push. Okay, let me see here. And then, uh, so I think these are broadcasting again. They are broadcasting. I'm ready to push, but there can be more than one. Right? When there is only one robot, that is not a problem. But the problem is when we have more than one that they are trying to push. We, we need to synchronize the push. Okay, so they are waiting here. They are saying, I'm ready to push, I'm ready to push, I'm ready to push. Right? If all of them answer, yes, I'm also ready, then they move to, to push. Now they are applying the uh, primitive that I talked before. Right? They are trying to push. If there is only one and it cannot, Right, so it will go here. Uh, it will relocate, and at the same time, it will increase active, and it will broadcast. So everybody detects this active that is now two. So the ra the robot with rank two will start moving uh, to prepare. Right. Meanwhile, the other is relocating to it leaves a space uh, for for the other robot to to prepare. Right, and then. One is prepared, it's, in, uh, it's broadcasting, I'm ready, I'm ready. Meanwhile, the other is coming, it's preparing, then uh, it, it reaches. Once it's prepared to push, finish the prepare, then they are broadcasting. Now, both say, okay, we are ready. Okay, so let's push. And we can continue with this, right? If two are not enough, if they need three, they will do that and so on. Okay, and then, and they will move the box. Uh, let me see here. I think there is something uh, maybe not completely clear. So what we do for uh, the box? Okay, I will return to the to this. So the box, what we are moving is. Um, so we move the box to the center, and then from this, we will move uh, toward the fastest robot. Right? When it reaches the fastest, they move here. So that means that the robots need to do some other primitives. Uh, actually, it's the same primitive, right? So when the robot, when this robot is here, it will uh, do a traversal, a, a chain phase, right? So positioning here and then pushing here, they will push together the box. So now the box is here. And now they will do another chain phase. Move here. Okay, here, 
and again they push right if there are two they do exactly the same but we are reducing these primitives that i mentioned before right the uh, chain phase so that's why we design in that way because we can reduce a lot uh, of code okay so this actually is just a again do a prepare right they are changing phases so it's a prepare and then they, they apply exactly the same algorithm here right over and over and over okay uh any question uh no that's good okay so here we, uh, for this uh for the moment i'm assuming that no failures but actually something that was very important in this project is to check failures right a robot can fail along the way uh, there may be obstacles. We can consider an obstacle when they are moving the box in the in 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 the corridor. We call it right this corridor. Maybe there is an obstacle, right? So eventually there may be a an obstacle here, and then when we are trying to move the box, they cannot because there is this obstacle. So what they need is to do another chain phase, right? So they go uh, to the lower part move a little bit up then they return and they continue okay that would be one of the failure another failure is that the, the, we can have a robot uh, uh, at any time right that they're trying to push and eventually this fails it disappears right so then another robot needs to take over so it needs it will apply exactly the same thing uh, uh what i did uh so it will go to the front it will apply exactly the same but here is just a minor thing right so if the robots are on the left side we'll move to the right or to the left okay and uh what is the other failure failure uh, again is with communication well, communication is a lot of uh, problems that we can face uh so we are missing uh that they are pushing and if one of them push uh, more what is going to happen is that the box right if i have two robots here right? i have a robot here another robot here and then if uh let's say the red one this red one pushes more what is going to happen is that this will rotate right because one is given more uh, forces and then the boxes start moving uh, in a different shape. So in order to maintain the orientation of the box, they need to push almost at the same time. Okay. Okay, so I think that's everything. So there is this other primitive recovery. It's a little bit more difficult, but- Question? It's, um, um, okay, yes. Question? Um, what what was the end goal? I didn't quite understand the end goal state. Or the end goal is to move the box. Move them down the corridor. To the lower part where the robots are, and then we impose to the farthest uh, 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 place. Uh, so the, take the robot that is, uh, uh, that is uh, at uh, longest distance from the box. So the box should be in that direction at the very end. So X4, like X4 in this case is the yeah, first. Yeah, so in this case, what I would like is to send the box somewhere here. Oh, okay. Right, I, I don't want to send it uh, just here because there are robots and, and I can just over, uh, run over this. So Oscar, okay. I, I got in here late. This is Buzz, I'm sorry. Um, what, uh, who has the, um, the management uh, algorithm or goal, if you will, is it centrally located and communicated to the robots? Um, no, or is it everything, everything, is distributed. everything is distributed. All the robots are the same. Oh. Okay. So, so uh, there is no single point of failure. One can fail and then the other will join. The, the, another robot will take over uh, this uh, the um, faulty robot, and they can continue. So they each have then the end goal uh, stored somewhere in order to um, achieve this algorithmic movement ultimately. Yes. So in other words, there's no leader. They're all equally. Uh, yes. No leader. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they, uh, they communicate between themselves? Yes. Yes, they are communicating all the time. They oh. are uh, infinitely often sending messages. I'm here and this is what I'm doing. I'm in this state, things like that. And what is the mode of communication between the robots then? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Uh, what, what is the mode of communication between the robots? Is it Wi-Fi okay. or Bluetooth or what? It, they are using, it's actually a uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, 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 chip, but uh, I changed this. I have uh, something that is called TDMA. Uh, time division medium access. So what it does is, uh, so you can think like a cake, right? And then at this moment, uh, one transmits, and this moment, two transmits, and so on. But what is the, what is the actual transmission mode? Is, is, are they using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or? And so I told you, it's a, the chip is a, a Bluetooth, but uh, the protocol is not Bluetooth. Yeah, understood. Okay. Yeah, you're using TDMA as a as a priority kind of uh, communication protocol. Yes. Yes, Thank because this allows to have real time, right? So I know that it takes at most seven uh, uh, steps to transmit again, right? Because the cake is divided by seven. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's see the the output of this. Okay, too much theory here. Of course, there are much more than this. This is just a simple uh, overview of this. So let's see the video. Okay, the funding. Okay, I hope you can, I don't remember it has sound, so. So you see, now they are doing the scanning. Right, the, the robot on the right hasn't finished. The other, have, they have finished. Okay, so they have seen the box. Okay, uh, so now the one that is closest is the one that approach. Right, so it's approaching. You see, they are reaching the box to the center. Try to, right, with the distance sensors, with the camera. Now they are traversing, they are doing the, the chain phase, primitive. Right, uh, so I told you before it starts in phase zero, so it will traverse two phases. Okay, sometimes it moves like that and then uh, traverse this phase. Then, it, while it's traversing, they are measuring the distance of the box. Okay, according to the uh, to the uh, flow deck, the odometer that we have. Okay, they detect that it has finished, goes to the center, they measure, they, they try to go to the center. Of course, this not always uh, works fine. Sometimes it made mistakes. So you can see now that the wheels are spinning. That is trying to push. I try, uh, I think, three or four times. If it can, then fine. Then you see the robot on the left, so let me return a little bit. Okay, so here you can see that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the robot that's trying to push is not able to push. Okay, and then uh, therefore it will ask for help. How do we ask for help? We have this variable active, it increments by one, and then it will start the um, uh, relocation, uh, relocate uh, primitive. Right? Meanwhile, the uh, one of the robots that is in behind, the one with has, uh, that has uh, rank two is the one that moves. So let's see here again. So it's pushing, it's trying to push, then uh, increment the active, the other is approaching. Okay, now it doesn't need to measure the distance of the box because the other has already passed. They say, okay, this is what I measure. Okay, that's actually difficult because uh, they need to have very similar uh, movements, m measures, right? When they're uh, moving, they need to follow similar things. Okay, sometimes fails, but I, it was able to recover nicely. Okay, and now they are pushing. This time, they two were enough. So you see that they start at the same time pushing, right? So let me return a little bit this. 
So, Oscar, a brief question then. Does the uh, first, uh, second robot have information of where the first mo robot then moved slightly to the left of the box? Yes. Uh, so, in the algorithm, it will, uh, the, uh, I will call robot with rank one. Right? That's the one, the one that was in the center. It always moved to the left. They measure the size of the box. And they, they, what they know is that there are two. There should be two active robots, ah. even if it's not there, right? So they measure that, and they just compute some mathematical thing, right, to try to position it in the right place. So each of the robots then has sort of an accounting system to keep track of the, uh, the state, if you will, uh, and where each of the other robots are, the no. other helper robots. No, everybody maintains their own state. The other robot, yeah, I hear what the other are saying, but I just keep the last one. I'm not going to have this history or anything like that. Oh, oh so each new one keeps track of the previous uh, one, so to speak. Yes, uh, so it just uh, you uh, inform to me. I'm uh, writing, I'm doing something. And then based on that, we decide what to do the next step. I, we don't need to maintain any history of what has happened before. But does each robot need to know all of the states of the predecessors? Or no. just the no, previous no. one? Just the last state. OK, thank you. OK, so you see here, when they're trying to push, look that they start at the same time pushing. Right? You can see that. So that's the synchronization part. If this is not working properly, we have a problem. And the boxes start moving in another direction. So we have an algorithm for that. Uh, so if they detect that the other didn't uh, listen, so this is the consensus uh, a protocol, something I talked last time, that's part of the, uh, my autopilot, the, the, uh, uh, all the, the test bed that I'm using. It has all of these things. So they detect that the other didn't listen, they stop. Only till all of them are able to listen, they will continue. Okay, so then they are pushing to the other side. Okay, so at that moment, uh, the, the program uh, finished. So robot just stop, and that's all. Okay, so this is the, when there is an obstacle, they, they take that there is an obstacle because they cannot push the box anymore. All right, so they move to the, uh, to the other phase, push a little bit and then try. All right, of course, if they cannot push the box here, they need to return, do it again. And then uh, here we, okay, this is very fast. That's the very last part of, yeah. Uh, let me put it again. I don't know if I have uh, slow motion. Okay, so here uh, we remove one of the robots. We just turn it off. Right? That's how we simulate uh, a failure. And then uh, the robot that is uh, in the, uh, pushing detects that. And then uh, the robot that uh, fails has rank one. Right? This has rank two, right? Uh, that was the second one that joins. So therefore, uh, the rank uh, two becomes rank one, and it will locate where the uh, first robot was, right? uh, the robot with rank one. And then uh, the second, uh, the other robot will just join. Uh, it will have now a rank of two. So it will join to the position that this was before. Okay. That was really fast. Uh, we have just two minutes video, I think, for the presentation that we have at that moment when we present this in aerospace. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think this is all. Okay, so any question that you have? Okay, uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. Yeah. What? Um... What language, programming language, did you use to implement all of these algorithms then? The state machine and everything. Okay, so the state machine actually, um, it's 
uh, in C is in the TINC. The TINC is actually the one that is controlling all of this. Okay, uh, that's C++. Well, actually, it's more C. Uh, I think you can use some C++ things. Uh, so that's in the TINC. And then uh, in the JSON, I'm use Python. What, what does the Python, uh, well, what does the Jetson uh, code uh, do exactly? Actually, it's almost not doing anything. Uh, it, uh, so the Jetson is connected to the Arduino, the Arduino to the distance sensors. So the Jetson is computing the distances. Did you or see it's just actually getting the distance and passing to the TNC directly. Now, did you say laser distance? Yes. Okay, those are those are nice nicer than the ultrasonic. Uh, yeah, the ultrasound are really bad. So let me see. So yeah, I think I have some distance sensors here. So you see, this these are the distance sensor. I have two in front. Yeah. So somebody is going to say something. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say, aren't you using the 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 Jetson to process the the video feed from the from the camera yes. to detect the... Yes. So this is uh, getting the distance and send it to, to the uh, TNC. It actually doesn't do anything with this. It's just a, a bridge within the uh, Arduino and this. And then uh, it also uses the camera. Camera and detects uh, an... Uh, or... Okay, camera and uh, Aruko right the detection of the ids uh which is also computing the orientation the it aligns with the normal of the of the aruco right so it it does some computation with alignment so i would say compute uh compute a normal normal vector does it do that from the uh, actual, like, the, the trans, um, from the image being transposed, essentially, at an angle? Yes. Yes, I think the, uh, well, for this, it's open, uh, it's uh, open CV. Uh, open CV has something like this. It's just a little bit of math, but... Does, is the, is, we are also identifying which box, is that what the Aruko? Yes, so the output of this with the camera, it's a number. Uh, it's a number one, two, three, whatever. That, so that's easy to, to recognize. So each box has a different uh, uh, code. And you get an, you get a, an angle or a nor you, yes. you know what yes, we, you are to the normal. Oh, oh yes, and also distance. I can compute the distance, right? If I know the original uh, size of the uh, Aruco, the, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, code, I detect at some distance. So, so okay, so you say uh, my code is this side, right? That's my official. When the camera is exactly at, uh, let's say, one meter, right? So let's say this is one meter by one meter, and then, when you detect the error code that is maybe uh, this side, then you can just uh, do a simple uh, operation, right? To detect what is the distance. It's not perfect, but it works fine. The normal works fine, I think also. So, I don't remember how we did the, the normal, I, but yeah, it was difficult. You have the laser distance too, right? I mean, yes, the laser distance at the beginning doesn't work, right? It's too far, uh, and uh, even if they work, so okay, let me put it again in the video. Yeah, so uh, with the distance sensors, you cannot distinguish whether uh, the, uh, it's a box or it's something else. Right? It's an obstacle that is far, far away. Okay. So uh, you need first to detect with the camera. Once you detect with the camera, you 
uh, try to get uh, closer to the arrow code, the center. Once you are in the center, you can use the distance sensors to know the distance uh, with much more precision. So Oscar, um, is the source code of this project um, possibly available to use as a learning tool um, to tinker and play and use some of the basic concepts, but for possibly other kinds of applications? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's still not open source, uh, but uh, that's my, my goal at the end to put it this uh, open. And so my whole uh, goal is not at least, that was just an application that happens that uh, they were interested. And my whole interest is in uh, a test bed uh, that actually you can implement things and some other things. See, I'm so what, in terms of um, encoding a simulator basically and using some of the core algorithmic concepts in order to tinker and play with um, all kinds of different objects, different strategies, different kinds of things, but some of what you've done here has some really uh, basic algorithmic approach that seems like it'd be applicable in a number of different instances and it would be fun to kind of, you know, uh, learn from the code and possibly encode it in other languages or whatever um, to tinker and play. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, my goal is uh, to, to have something at the end. Uh, if not for the whole public, it's for uh, students at Cal State. Uh, uh, so uh, CSU, uh, I mean, uh, Computer Engineering, Computer Science. Oh, so okay. the idea is uh, of uh, the program. So I have created a, a stack layer. Right? So uh, what I presented here was the, um, an application. I have another paper that is for uh, the, the whole ar architecture of this. I, the uh, test bed. So my ultimate goal uh, is to have something. This is the uh, state machine, the input output to state machine. So here I'm encoding the program. So you can see scan. Yeah, so this is like a meta program then of the algorithm for the state machine. Yes, so the idea is to implement just this part without worrying about uh, the taste like hardware like how to move the, uh, the, the car, right? Yeah, so yeah, the all works. of this I will try to abstract until we have simple uh, instructions. You can say, move straight uh, 10 centimeters, move left, move right. Right, right. So um, what about the, um, do you have a meta code or anything for each of uh, or, you know, the overall distributed management system, uh, or is it embedded in here? I may be missing something. Uh, okay, so this is the pseudo code for this application. Okay, the ones, uh, I mean, the, the uh, SAC layers, all the implementation of this, I don't have it here. I have in another uh, document. Uh, some of this is still not complete. It's almost complete. So this is in a paper that, that you've written and published or, or no? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to publish. Hopefully it's accepted. Now there is a workshop coming. Uh, I submitted and I hope this, this and the other paper will be accepted. Okay, well, is, it, is this available through you at this stage, this draft or whatever? Yeah, I think at this moment, if you need, I can um, provide the uh, paper, the two papers. That would be great. I'd love to learn more about this. You've done a terrific job here. Where are you going to publish? Yeah, we'd like to see that paper, uh, the papers. Uh, I don't remember the conference. I can check. <laughs> Actually, it's a conference that it was in... Um, Marina del Rey, oh, uh, but uh, because of this, it's, it's not cancelled, it would be just virtual. And um, I don't remember, it's something about drones actually. Oh. Hmm. I can search. 
Yeah, if, if you could host them on the, on the uh, university website or, or I don't know, some, some place. Or, or yep. is it possible, Alan, to post uh, some of this information on the uh, uh, RSSC site? Yeah, I can send this to Ben, and Ben can uh, publish somewhere there. Yeah, we can put oh, it on our website. Definitely. It's this with Roy 2020. It's an international one. I don't know how good is this. Yeah, that would be great. I, I heard that if you can sweet talk the author of a paper, sometimes they'll slip you a copy of it at no charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I will stop uh, broadcasting. Still, we can. I cannot use the camera meanwhile I'm broadcasting, so. So, uh, uh, Dr. Morales, a couple of follow-up questions. Yes. When you're uh, motion and path planning for uh, for a load, you can always do it from the perspective of the load and the forces applied to it, or uh, from the perspective of the robots exerting a first uh, force on, on a load. You had mentioned the importance of pushing it in a straight line. Um, for those of us who have tried to get a robot to drive in a straight line, we understand exactly what order of magnitude more complicated that is um, than, than just driving to get two robots to nudge something in the right direction. Um, do you have any, uh, depending on how heavy the object is, the friction characteristics of the ground, of ground each corner of the box, uh, friction or slippage for the wheels, you know, they, it, you could go sideways in any number of ways. Um, have you run into any problems pushing the box? How, how have you made it? Uh, yeah, of course we have a lot of problems with this. Um, yeah, I think we kind of see it. So it, uh, for some people, it was a little bit difficult to understand that it was possible. The main thing that we have is actually I'm using completely my framework, my uh, test bed, uh, the one that I presented last time. So uh, to do that, to, to properly push the box without uh, star rotating in um, different directions is the agreement protocol. Everybody needs to agree that they are ready to push. Right? And then they need to decide when to stop also. It's well, extremely important. If you miss that, then uh, everything is a mess. You start pushing in one direction and then it's difficult to, to recover. The, uh, in our case, something that was also interesting from this, okay, I don't know, probably you don't remember last time, but uh, the protocol that I have, I call it um, streaming broadcast. So uh, consensus is impossible. I mentioned last time, it's impossible. You cannot solve it. No matter what you do, you cannot solve it because a uh, message can be lost. Okay, and there is a proof for that, a mathematical proof for this. Okay, uh, so instead of solving, uh, what I have is this other uh, protocol that I call streaming protocol. And on this, what I can do is to, okay, let's assume that you can fail. But if you fail, right, if you cannot agree, let's do this for the minimum number of rounds, right? Because if it's for the minimum number of rounds, uh, the damage that you can make is minimal. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's extremely important this part. I think without this, uh, I don't think you can do it. Uh, it will take too much time and probably never uh, do it completely correct. You know, I'm not saying that uh, what I have works all the time, but I would say like 99% of the time uh, they they move the box correctly. So I was going to ask about the the time you have a uh, clocks on all on board. I assume yes. you have to coordinate the uh, the time that you're going to push at the same time. Is that um, that's kind of a difficult thing? Do you, do you, does each yes. robot say, okay, we're going to do it in five, four, three? Uh, it's actually kind of that. It's not exactly that they use a clock and say, okay, it's three ten, so three fifteen we push. Uh, so it says, it's a protocol that is actually in the other paper uh, that says, uh, are you ready? Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And then 
they wait a little bit and then they push or they it's not about pushing it's about changing to to another state to to okay so what you have is i can divide the time into different parts one is the progress that you make right that's when actually the uh, actuators are moving and then another part that is for synchronization because some of them may finish earlier. And another part, and just to, uh, I call it voting for uh, just the final synchronization. Okay, so you can start pushing or you can say, okay, I'm ready, I'm in the progress part. Then you move to uh, uh, the synchronization part. So you cannot, uh, you need to wait there till actually everybody reach that state, synchronization. Once you hear that everybody is in the synchronization, you move to voting. But while you move to voting, you also send the message and say that, okay, I'm in voting for one round. So the other can move to voting, but uh, with less number of rounds. It's, I know it's not so simple. So Oscar, uh, as I think about it, this is Buzz again. Um, if you think of a couple of people pushing a heavy piece of furniture and they want to move it in a straight line in front of them. So when you break that down into the details, you have communication between the two people doing the pushing. That's one part of it. The yes. second part, which is more subtle, is that each of those people have feedback within their neural systems as to their muscular strength and how much to push. And they sense the amount of force that they're putting on to their side of the box, so to speak. So yes. this would be a complication in a way, but could be done with robots similar to what Alan suggested about measuring the resistance of the wheels or the motor current or whatever for each of the robot um, uh, motive parts. And you could then communicate back and forth between the two robots in an effective way in order to coordinate how you go about pushing this uniformly. If there's, say, a two pound weight in that box on one side, and there's no feet on the other side, obviously one of the robots would have to push with So. Yeah, it I could agree. It's complicated a bit more, but it could be dealt with. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but I, I, that approach will be really difficult. Right, because then you need to see your um, uh, if the wheels are skidding. That's actually very difficult, right? Uh, how much push you uh, 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 do? Again, extremely difficult because you have battery, right? You need to measure your battery, and then there may be a peak at that moment. Uh, so, really, the amount of variables that we can have is huge. Yeah, it gets tricky. It, it gets very tricky. And you have to do this real time uh, in milliseconds, probably, to update dynamically each robot's contribution and what they need to do and communicate it back and forth and yes. you know, to resolve all that. So yeah. I agree that so, it's not a trivial project. But. So for this, I change that. So let's simplify this. So you yeah. say two people are moving uh, some furniture. Uh, it's a piece of furniture. Okay, so would it be easier if you say, okay, uh, one, two, three, and we move one step. And then next time, one, two, three, one step. Uh, you know that one step is about one meter, half a meter, right, or something. So if you follow this, uh, you are uh, um, abstracting all these huge amount of variables that you can have into something simple. So instead, you program the robot to say, okay, and let's measure the distance that the robot can move, right? So we say uh, every step, they are moving 10 centimeters. After 10 centimeters, they stop. And then you have uh, um, a semaphore that says, okay, now, now, now. So they're pushing synchronous. Right, right. That is much better than using the other approach where they are completely asynchronous and then uh, just measuring everything they need to communicate, but the time that takes to communicate and you receive, everything has changed, right? All the variables. 
But if, if the box starts to rotate due to the differences of, you know, friction on the wheels and uh, the weight on one side of the box versus the other, if it starts to rotate, there needs to be an assessment of some sort so that one of the robots can make an adjustment to get things back to, um, you Okay, know. so let me explain uh, with this. So what we say is that two robots are the minimum robots that we need to move the box. Okay, so you say uh, they are uh, pushing and then one of them are pushing more, right? So they're yeah. sliding. Okay, we detect uh, 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 a, a failure there because they couldn't synchronize. So immediately it will stop, but actually it cannot push more because it, there is no, no force to, for the robot to move that uh, box. Okay, so then they synchronize again to push. They, uh, at that moment, when they're pushing, they're uh, kind of balancing again the box. I guess I sort of missed the, what was going on in that last part that you explained, how, how they balance it back again so that this, the face of the box is now parallel to the two of them again. Yeah, okay, so I guess here the most important part is to make steps, short steps, every time. You synchronize these short steps, and uh, then you maximize the effects. But the thing is, is, somewhere along the line, don't you get an error that accumulates if one happens to be moving the box with more force than the other, the other one, ha the other robot has to- that, Probably, yes. Has to determine that it needs to the first robot who's pushed more has to back off a little bit and wait for the second robot to kind of uh, equalize or minimize the error of the position of the box again so that they can okay. think again. Yeah, okay, yes. But, you need much more things. You will need GPS, you will need a lot of things. That, okay, good luck with that. No, I understand it adds more complexity for sure. And I know what you've done is more of a concept demonstration uh, which you've done very effectively and um, much appreciated for your work I mean that's that's a neat kind of thing to do um, but I'm just kind of considering you know more ramifications and additional complexity if one wanted to have a truly adaptive system that would be um, perhaps a smoother operation due to error that might ac accumulate I wouldn't wouldn't uh, uh, what Buzz is describing uh, would be uh, that the box is too heavy for one robot and wouldn't the, the flow meter detect that that one, the wheels are spinning, but the robot is not moving enough. So wouldn't that cause a fault and call another robot to come and help? Mm, no, they, uh, once they are able to push uh, the box, they are assuming that they uh, can push the box. But if the, the second, if the second robot uh, keeps slipping, yeah, once they are inside the uh, corridor, then they're locked in. Then, then uh, they are assuming that they can push the box. Okay. Now, if the box goes off um, angle, um, is there a correction? For, I didn't catch. No, it. I don't have any correction. Okay, not yet, or not not in this implementation. Yeah. That's a failure state. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Morales, that's a that segue into my next. Uh, you touched on something that I think is a really fascinating philosophical concept. Um, and it, I, I think, depending on where you're coming from, you'll see it expressed in different ways. Um, the way I always see it is the real world is messy, right? Um, so when you say that um, census is impossible, whether you're working on a single robot with more than one sensor, like a distance sensor and a stereographic camera, um, or you're doing sensor fusion between um, different types of um, odometry, or if you're sharing information among bots to get like a collective picture because the real world's messy and error is cumulative, it's effectively impossible to, to get it as well as in simulation. Could you, could you talk for a few minutes about your experience with that? Because whenever you mention, um, you mentioned it, I see a little curl in your lip like you've had to deal with it. I have to do, uh, okay. Um, okay, can you repeat your question? Oh yeah, sure, no Sorry. problem. 
Uh, consensus is uh, run into it all the time when we're trying to compare the information for more than one sensor. You know, it, when you have multiple agents or multiple bots and, and you're comparing notes for a state of the world, it just compounds the issue. But even if you're um, using two different sensors to measure the same thing, there's a certain amount of plot because the real world is messy. Uh, this is how I understand yes. the inability to, to attain consensus. I wanted I was wondering what your experiences were because every time you mentioned the word consensus, I think I see your lip curl a little bit. <laughs> like you bumped into it once or twice. <laughs> uh, okay, I kind of understand your question, but uh, okay. So you say that the word is messy. Yeah, actually, uh, in general, a problem like this would be, I would say, no matter what approach you are uh, going to use, almost impossible. The only way that you can solve a problem is if you have perfect information for everybody, right? Uh, for example, if you are using um, how is the motion tracking system extremely fast and everybody receives, maybe you are able to solve this in some way. I still don't believe completely. So one issue is uh, information. You, uh, so what we have is a Kalman filter that does uh, efficiency, uh, efficiency uh, 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 and things. Uh, and works okay. I mean, it's not perfect, but it works okay. Okay, but it's, uh, there is always error. Actuators, when you apply the motor, there's gonna be failures. It's impossible to say move exactly 10 centimeters and 10 centimeters will move. You will always move more or less. Okay, uh, so then uh, when you communicate, when it's one robot, uh, it's okay, you never see so much effects. When there are more than one robot, every single uh, step counts. Now it's not so trivial. Uh, and the, the idea or, or the way that we would like to see this is something central or something that instantaneously by its own magic, everybody receives information and everybody knows exactly the same. Okay, so that's, uh, we are overcoming or overseeing the problem of communication. Communicating takes uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of time. I mean, by a lot of time, I meant 200 milliseconds, right? Uh, the communication that I have, we can communicate within uh, uh, 60 milliseconds, but we need to repeat one, two, three times. So uh, effectively, we can communicate about every 200 milliseconds. So at this 200 milliseconds, that's a big gap within movements that can happen, All right? Uh, so it's, the information that I have is too old to apply. Okay, so I think uh, for me, uh, from my point of view, it's better to synchronize, to, uh, to have a, 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 a consensus protocol. Let's agree on, let's agree to do something, right? If, uh, if we don't consider that, then everybody will pretend that the other is going to do what they supposed to do without actually knowing that actually they are doing this. So everybody's working on their uh, assumptions. Well, at some point, you're, you're mapping this thing, right? Both of them have a map that says where they are in space? No. Um, no, uh, there is no point to map this because uh, everybody has a, a, a little bit different uh, movement. So what I'm saying, one meter for you can be a meter and a half or a, a, a jar, right? So you have sensors. The sensors you have are what? Ultrasound and uh, video to find the uh, yeah. tag? You have a flow deck to detect the, uh, the speeds. Uses uh, lasers. lasers to detect the distance. Distances? Yes. What? Does, he, does each robot, Oscar, yeah, have, but, know where it's at in uh, on this floor or in space? Does each one know that, or are they just sort of determining distance from the box? 
Yeah, they are using the box as a means to uh, a reference. Agree, a yeah, reference. exactly, a reference. Agree on the uh, coordinate system, but not not necessarily. They agree completely in this, right? Because the units are different. But you have to know where they want to move the box to, right? Yeah, uh, what we know is that they need to push the box for some distance. Uh, we need to, uh, that's a little bit tricky because the distance, my distance can be different from your distance. So there is one that needs to say, the, actually the one has, has run one that says, okay, for me, I finish and everybody needs to agree on that. Okay, so they have a quite uh, a similar uh, reference system once they are in the box, but uh, but not necessarily the units are the same. It sounds like most of the almost all the information is stored in the state in the state machine. Yes. Right. So yes. Um, the so when you when each robot gets to the a state say we agree to push then um then it's just a matter of the message goes out to uh, to do it right and then they all or then the two of them do it uh, and to the next state yeah so everybody is receiving the uh, states of the others and then based on this everybody decides what to do okay what happens if the box when you when you show the box sitting there in your drawing you showed it orthogonal to where you wanted it to go but what happens if the box is angled? Okay, no, we are assuming that the box is aligned. Yeah. That's a strong assumption, yes. Yeah, you're assuming it's orthogonal to begin with. Yeah, we don't have a, a compass. If you don't, you have, don't have, a have a compass, that's going to be impossible. Actually, even if you have compass, compass is really vast, really vast. Okay, so I it seems you can agree completely. Yeah. That's what I was wondering was how do you align the box if it's not orthogonal? Yeah, no, it doesn't work. Doesn't we work. are assuming it. <laughs> okay, so you're just blindly pushing X, Y, Z distance. Yes. Okay, gotcha. It seems like um, like you're really not blindly pushing and the uh, the deck with the optical flow sensors, I would imagine isn't so inaccurate that um, you can't get roughly pretty close. So if you take step intervals as you described where you push for a little bit and then you can do a reassessment, it seems like it'd be pretty easy for you to make uh, some compensation. With the distance sensors? Yes. Yeah, with the distance sensors we can make a small compensa compensation, but because we don't have compass, we cannot compensate the angle of the box. Oh, when, when, when I, I uh, know I meant the optical flow. So they're not uh, extremely inaccurate, right? So the left and right robot, the distance traveled uh, according to the optical flow sensors is pretty accurate. I mean, not perfect, but pretty accurate, right? Yes. So yeah. then if one, let's say the right robot has pushed too much, if you're using this iterative approach where you go for a little while and then reassess, then the right robot would say, you know, I went three meters and the left robot said, oh, I only went 2.5 meters. And now it would be pretty easy to make a correction based just on that information. It's That's not true. perfect, That's but it true. seems like it would be quite good. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think we can do that. Yes. Yeah. So it's almost like a very low rate servo loop. Yes. Yeah, so, I think uh, it's great, great idea. So Oscar, ha um, have you had an occasion to run the experiments where you've required all four robots or more to um, no. be uh, required to help? <laughs> no, we need to have a big box. I mean, because I was wondering how smoothly the coordination between four units rather than just two would actually wind up being, or even a third. And yeah, we don't have enough space for this. You need to have a big box. I think we try with three. Well, you can always put weights in the box, you know. <laughs> Books. <laughs> yeah, the box, the size of the box. 
it should be large enough to accommodate three or four robots, right? And the robots are not so small. Ah. So yeah, actually, the box that we were using wider. is is large. I still am a little uh, foggy on how the um, the robots, the two robots, they will transition to the push state exactly at the same time. You know, due to what Alan was talking about, all you know, with sensor differences. This, but they they do transition at the same time, right? Yeah. And. But that's, they are, and they are talking to each other. Uh, so, and the messages are pretty fast, you said, right? Yes. Yes. So they have a, a minor um, uh, gap, of minor um, overlap, or, yeah, difference within the, the rounds, but it's almost uh, nothing. So normally you don't perceive this, right? And the idea is to make this TDMA to reduce the time that they communicate so try to minimize this uh, problem. Is that LoRa right? radio or is it Bluetooth? Sorry? Is that LoRa? What is LoRa? Uh, low range radio? No, it's just a normal uh, Bluetooth. We okay. send our wave um, 8295, I believe, or something like that. It's about 10K baud, something like that. Uh, yeah, we can transmit, and you say the payload? It's 60, uh, 30, 30 bytes that we can transmit for every. So yeah, all, another thing is that we need to compress everything to send very small uh, uh, payload, right? Because if you uh, fragment the message, then uh, you, will, you will need a lot of time. Yeah. It, so, it sounds like it's the same as the BLE, like the same as the, um... Uh, those little bots have the, um, what's it called, the BBC Micro has the BLE, but not, not enough memory for Bluetooth protocol, just, just the, the low level. Okay. That's called BLE. Yeah, I don't know. Let me, uh, I, okay, uh, what was the name of this? It's an, uh, I should have it here. Wait a sec. It's not too important. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's range right. indoor. There's so many protocols. So. Yeah, I'm yeah. just based on something I've been working with. Well, the, uh, the, the BBC Micro has the BLE, and you can send brief little messages to between those little bots, and it, but it doesn't have enough memory for Bluetooth because that's a huge protocol. Yeah, the, the one that I'm using is um, it has a Cortex M0 attached. So you can program in this Cortex M0. That's where I wrote this TDMA. Um, yeah, so that's the idea of this uh, uh, chip is to allow you to do your own algorithm if you want. It's not just a plug and play, right? Well, now it's plug and play, but. Uh, Dr. Morales, uh, if I could ask a more uh, general question. Yes. Uh, you took a challenge of going straight into the physical world and uh, program actual uh, robots uh, to do physical work. Usually uh, people try to do some uh, modeling in the computer model and there are simulation environments, for example, in ROS and stuff like that. Yes. Did you completely avoid this step or do you have a working model that allowed you to perfect your algorithm, uh, cooperation side of algorithm? No. Yeah, I, I, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a simulator. Uh, I wish I can have one because that will accelerate. Uh, what you say is true. I moved directly from the theory to the practice. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, a kind of uh, mathematical proof that it will work. So at least in that sense, um, uh, it was not blind, right? But yeah, of course we have a lot of issues with, with uh, physical things. You know, engineering is always, uh, it's a completely different from, from theory. 
Did you mention that you have mathematical proof that it will work at least on the cooperation side? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. We prove, uh, uh, well, I have a proof uh, for this algorithm and the ad paper. I have a proof for the other algorithm that I mentioned before, the synchronization part. Um, and then for the, uh, yeah, I think that's most of the, of the things. It's difficult to share these results. Obviously, you can publish a paper but you cannot for example allow people to download your model and play with it and introduce some variables and prove that it works in their conditions and break it basically right i mean yes yeah but uh so the paper i can give it to uh ben uh so he can publish or just uh, uh redistribute uh, he can send it to you if you want. And when will your second paper be available or the information available possibly to look at also? Uh, both are in the same conference. So hopefully it's, both are accepted. I will know by uh, nine days, eight days. Well, would you Did have you drafts know? that you could give to Ben? Yeah, I can send the paper that I submitted. Both of them, possibly? Yes. That would be great. Thank you. Appreciate you very much for that. You're welcome. Uh, so, to the conference, um, do you have a plus one yet? I Do I have what? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go with you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> if you want, you can present. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to fall for the ride. Uh, Dr. Morales, thank you very much for presenting tonight. I, I know there are some concerns about filling up the space, but as you can see, you have a, a captive audience that is deeply invested in the material and what you're doing. Um, and thank you. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. Thank you. That, thank was, you. that was great. Yeah, nice you. presentation. Yeah, was really thank good. you very much. So I will send the papers to Ben and uh, the paper, one of the paper has a video, the link to the video in YouTube. Great. Good luck with the big boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That's that was great, doctor. Thank you very much. Great Thank work. You. Welcome. Use your oh, uh, wow. reactions. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of claps. <laughs> I just see some of them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think I, I'm leaving because my wife is waiting for me for to oh. have dinner. <laughs> you go right ahead. Enjoy. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, guys, and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Thank you again. Enjoy Thanks. your supper. Good night. Good night. Hey, Bye. can I make a quick announcement? Uh, go ahead, Tim. I want you guys to know I just started working again. <laughs> Yay. Oh, congratulations, man. Congratulations. I just, just finished the first week of this co company I work for down in Irvine. So it's pretty cool. Good. Good job. Getting to play with these uh, uh, boards that have the built-in uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth thing on it. It's cool. And that are compatible to be programmed with the Adreno IDE. Ah, so I got nice. the Cortexa chips on there. Yeah. Nice. Uh, right on. And uh, so it looks like we're celebrating. I love choice and shirt tonight. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you'd like my new shirt. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, Buzz, are you still there? Yes, I am. I found that uh, artificial neuron cell you were wanting me to find. I found it. Which? The artificial neuron cell. Oh, okay. I found the paper on it, and I found some more information on it that I had. Okay. Well, Unfortunately, I don't know how to get it to you. <laughs> well, I think, didn't you send me something to my email, and so you have my email address? I did, but this is a, this is a paper uh, that you haven't seen before. It was done by Bell Labs. Oh. Oh. Hmm. 
Well, and uh, goes into a little more detail on the neuron cell, and uh, shows basically what uh, something I uh, shows how it works, well, making like an artificial eyeball. So um, I could, I think I've got your email address still from what you sent no, me. My problem is I don't have any way of scanning it at the moment. Oh, oh, I see. I take, a, a very, take a picture with your a, phone. It's very old. Uh, papers that I, I still stapled together, and I would have to, I'd have to unstaple it and Xerox you a copy, maybe. I don't know. Take a picture with your phone. Well, the phone doesn't work for we'll us. Resolution. But he can take the picture and email the pictures to you. Well, Same. since Buzz wants it, I was thinking maybe uh, at some point uh, taking it apart and have it, uh, you know, uh, duplicate Xerox or something. Well, be careful with it since it's such an old paper. And um, well, I mean, it dates back to my inland science fair when I was in high school. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Well, if you want to pursue this further, um, let's talk offline so we don't tie everybody else up with this. I just thought I mentioned to you I found this out yeah. of paper yet. No, thank you. It hasn't seen that it's not out there you, that you can grab anywhere. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, gentlemen, uh, should we start the show and tell? And then after that, if you guys want to just keep uh, talking and catching up. I believe Thomas was first. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Ooh, hey, Thomas, how you doing? Thanks yeah, for being yeah. here. Appreciate it. I'm going to switch my camera so you can see it just a second. I got a new, um, a new device, a new sensor, as it were. Let's see, is it working? Oh, there we go. Wrong camera. Oh, you. Right camera. Good, I got the right camera. Yep. Okay, let me turn off the background, otherwise you won't see it. I didn't know you could do a background on that. Yeah, too bad you can It's not an easy way to turn it off and on. Oh, there's your lab. Yeah. So I bought this device. It's called the Husky Lens. And it's, uh, anybody hear this device before the husky lens i just got i just bought one myself i haven't opened it yeah well there you go well i just got bought it and i've been using it and um it's so it's a so-called ai chip can we see his video or can you or... i'm going to show you the video in a second oh no, never mind i got it now, uh, what is that board, Thomas? It's called a Husky Lens. And it, yes. um, let me just see what it's doing. Is it, is it showing me? Yep. Yep. It's a, it has it's glare, but you can see it on there. Yeah. Well, it got built-in display or something? Yeah, and it identifies things. It, if I get it just right, it'll say I'm a person. If I get it wrong, it'll say I'm an animal or a dog or a cat. <laughs> Um, and this thing uh, ran me about 50 bucks. It's a, it, they're calling it an AI camera. Um, it can learn objects. It, it can learn faces. Um, it does color. It can trace colors. It can do line following uh, via the way the donkey car does the line following with AI, of course. Um, and it also does those uh, funny square things. I forget what they're called. We use them in Leaf. Anybody remember those square? Mounting boxes? No, no, no. The, 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 the emblems you stick on things so it can identify it. It's the fiducials. Fiducial. Yeah, I can use those. QR codes? Oh. QR. Is it a QR code? I don't know. I'll have to. I'll show you. Fiducials. Uh, these... They're that's And that's what the, the last demo was. Yeah. All right. Shows. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is, that a, is, that a, is that a button battery, um, you know, horizontally off to the opposite side of the, yeah, that right there. Yeah, uh, that gives you your different modes. I, I don't know if I can get it to, to, to uh, focus. This, I got a new camera, so I don't know how to set the focus. Is it focusing? No, it's not. Everything's out of focus now. Let's try that. Yeah, there we go. It's trying to frame a face or something. That's me. Okay, so there's a bunch of modes here. And um, 
everything's built into the chip here on the board, or you can program it from your uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Latte Panda, or Microbit. So it can interface with a large number of microcontrollers. Uh, it uses a, a, a chip called the Kendrite K210. And this is a 400 megahertz dual core RISC five 64 bit processor. And it's running, of course, neural network algorithms. It's running YOLO. You only look once um, for, for the, uh, for most of it, as I understand. I don't know, I haven't gotten that deep into it. I only got it a couple of days ago too. I just dug it out of the box and wanted to see what it was, what it could do as soon as possible. Um, they compare it to the STM32H743 chip. Anybody know about that chip? We'll all speak at once. Anyway, it says 30 times faster. You can see the frame rate is a lot faster. I'm going to put some uh, objects up on my screen for it to identify. And uh, we can just take a look at how good or not so good it is. Let me make sure I am in object recognition mode here. What's cool about it also, I read uh, the whole description before I bought it and it was, it's very easy to use, uh, more uh, easier than the Je Vois, if you're familiar, if anyone's familiar with the Je Vois uh, mm -hmm. uh, camera, or AI camera, but this one, um, you can interface it to your, through uh, serial to your uh, Arduino and it sends mess and you can easily see uh, messages um, for what it's seeing. It's an easy four wire connection to your Arduino and it does come with sample code. And as of last night, I was not able to get the sample code running. It came up with just random characters uh, when I was looking there. It worked for about 30 seconds and then, and then that was the end of that. All right, so um, let me turn the camera around on me. Uh, I may have to turn off the lights because it's getting a lot of glare, from, especially from the screen. Maybe if I go, now I gotta go this way. Okay. I need to turn the, uh, the the screen light down. Hold on, otherwise you won't be able to see it. Um, let's see. There's probably an easy way to do this. Okay. Now it's green. Maybe if I made it black. I mean, we can't really see what's on the screen. We can kind I'm, of. I'm trying to get it on. I want to show you a real live demonstration. Uh, I got too much light. There we go. There, there's my face, right? You can see my face. Yeah. And it's not putting a bound. Is it putting a bounding box? What do you see? I can't see it. It's too uh, it kind of flashes on and off. Okay, let's try over here. I'm trying. Maybe I'm going to shut off my overhead lights. Just give me a second. Yeah, I was thinking of putting that on my robot that um, <laughs> to give it some vision. You know, eventually every robot has to have vision. Every robot has to have vision, don't they? Okay, let's see. Is that better? That's glare, right? Uh, How about right there? Yeah, you keep it turned kind of sideways a little bit. Uh, no bounding box, though. No, it's not recognizing me. When I was pointing it at the screen, it was recognizing me. Maybe it's low light situation. Yeah, I'm seeing noise, so maybe it's too low light. Well, we did to the bell. Well, if I take it away from the, the the camera here, it won't get it. Is it on facial recognition? It does facial recognition, object recognition, color recognition, um, and a couple of line following, line recognition. It, it can do donkey cars, like I said a minute ago. The right mode. I saw you might have changed the mode. Uh, well, let me try turning it around. Oh, it works fine when I turn it at the screen. You're right. Maybe it's a light thing. Let me turn on more light. Sure, it does. Yeah, I could, you could see that the the um, the CCD is getting uh, you know noise uh, too okay, low. Okay, so I got the large overhead lights on. So unfortunately, I got a light behind me. So I'll try to cover it with my head. Uh, let's see what we get here. Oh, there, well, it looks great when it's looking at me. There we go. Oh, yep. there it is, yeah. Am yes. I per a person or a dog or a cat? We can't, can't read the it. text. It's too small. 
Yeah, you have a yellow box. That's all we know. Yeah, seems to be working pretty well. And that's a lot of frames per second. One of the limitations is it can only remember uh, 20 different objects. And you can uh, add more objects in real time, taking one to you know a thousand pictures at a time. I don't know if you can feed them into the uh, microcontroller. I mean the, the sensor by itself. Um, again, I did hook it up to my Arduino. Four wires, pretty easy. You put in their sample code, and it, it seemed to work for about one second, and <clears throat> then I got nothing but errors. So, what is the name of the device again, Thomas? This is called the Husky Lens. Let me let me uh, show share my desktop with you. Hold on. Yeah, Thomas, when you were looking at some other items, you could actually see that it was trying to identify the poster in the back. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see if I, I, yeah, I've got a bottle here. Let's see if we can identify this bottle. Alcohol. It's a rare thing these days. <laughs> let me go to this. Did it say bottle? It does say bottle. Look at that. That's bottle. And when you say 20 at a time, you mean 20 models of objects or 20 types of objects or 20 objects at the same time? It'll classify 20 different types of objects. Right. Okay. So yes, we can see the, the bottle. And, uh, but it's, it's not very accurate. <laughs> a lot of these aren't. Um, it was identifying bits and pieces of things. I have a fan on my table here. And it was identifying the fan as a as a bicycle. I mean, it's got a wheel in it. So, uh, although it did identify my robots as people, that, that's pretty good, you know. I got several robots around the room. You you can also train it to identify individual people, um, so, uh, up to several of those. So that can be quite useful, uh, as opposed to a generic person. That's true. Work that over this way. Problem is get, keeping it in focus. Is it identifying the robot as a person? It's not looking at the robot. It's not pointing yeah, at the, the robot. Yeah, the one in the background. Oh, yeah, way in the back. Yeah, it's a bounding yeah. box on it. That, that's Betty 8. That's <laughs> Betty 9. That's Betty 8. How about, how about Mel this year? Yeah. All right. Anyway, they run about 50 bucks plus shipping. Uh, they're shipped from, I think they're shipped from, um, can you help me out here? Is it Hong Kong? I thought it was China, like Hong Kong or something. Or yeah, I, I think it's yeah. Hong Kong. That's why it's more yeah. expensive. Shenzhen, usually. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't too much shipping. I don't remember paying much. And what, about $10, $15 or $10? Wasn't much, you're right. It wasn't too much. And it took, I don't know, about, not quite, a, about three weeks to get, and I ordered it off of Amazon, I think. I think it was Amazon. I can't remember where I ordered it from. Yeah, I didn't. I ordered it off DRF Rob, or I forget now, DF Robot. Yeah, I'll share the, uh, uh, Jim, will you uh, share the URL? Or, cause... I think someone already did. Yeah, it's, it's in the chat. All right. That's about so... it. Any questions? you have any plans for this? Oh, what for us? Uh, do you have any plans specifically for this? Oh, yeah. This is going on my fembot. <laughs> of course, That's yes. my new project, my fembots. I got, oh, I want to show you. I got fembot parts. You got to see some fembot parts. First thing, I don't have them by the camera because I just thought about it now. My FinBot version one will not have articulated fingers. So I'm just going to use a hand. This is a rubber mannequin. <laughs> you see this thing? And, uh, and I have uh, a, a head coming. And I, I don't know if I'm going to do feet or not. I think we'll just put her in boots and call it done. But, um, you know, it, it's uh, pretty, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, creepy. 
What's that? <laughs> where, so Thomas, <laughs> where, where did you obtain that from? Oh well, you know there was there's this mortuary across the street. Uh, Amazon.com, they sell it all. Really? Huh? Yeah, yeah. See, it's kind of kind of yeah. soft. Yeah, it has a kind of a, a body, uh, an actual natural feel to it as a body shape. Yeah, uh, I have another one that's a lot softer than this, but this, this is this is going to work just fine. Um, the, the goal here is to build a a, a Sophia-like robot. That's my goal, and uh, I'm going to be documented on my um, on my YouTube channel. So. Those of you who want to follow me, uh, Thomas Messerschmidt, just search, search for me. And look for the guy with the robots, not the other Thomas Messerschmitt. Yes, there are other Thomas Messerschmitt. Really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, anyway, as I collect this stuff, uh, I'm still waiting for the head. And then there's, there's going to be a full torso coming. It, it's, it's, a, it's a skin you drape over the robot. And I'm going to drape it over uh, my robot, my other mannequin. I have several. I bought three of these large mannequins that you can see the road. What I got the wrong camera. Oh, I got the sensor for the camera. Um, you see the the one with the blue hair in the background? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I have uh, three of those mannequins. They're life size mannequins. Actually, they're bigger than life size. They're about six feet. I don't know how many too many women that are six feet tall. Anyway, uh, and they are uh, they're going to be the basis for these ro this robot. Oh, and I got data, a new head, set of hair. It looks better than his old hair. So um, I'm probably the only one in the world who puts wigs on their robots. I don't know too many other people who put wigs on their robots. That, that one in the middle, he doesn't have a wig. That, that's another Elvis. But that's another, this is a long story, the Elvis story. That one looks like a board queen. Story. What's that? That one in the middle looks like the board queen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm working with. There, there's more body parts there. I, body parts. <laughs> this is getting gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. Did you see my commercial? <laughs> yes. All right, guys. Uh, that's about it for me. Uh, I'm sure I've overstayed my welcome here. So who's next? Jim. Yeah, I'm gonna go uh, sure. next. Uh, try to be uh, pretty brief because it's getting late. All right, I'll try to share screen now. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I wanted to uh, show um, just uh, my pro some progress. I've already posted this, but I wanted to briefly show the progress I've made on the um, the uh, big orange robot with lidar that I presented a month ago, over a month ago, a month and a half ago, and, um, and I, how I uh, integrated the sonar um, transducers into its system and added those as sensors. Uh, and those sensors actually uh, go into the same board, uh, the uh, SlamTech um, breakout board, and they, uh, after modifying the code that handles all the sensors that are in the STM32 board, uh, I was, I, I got the, the sensor data feeds itself back up into the proprietary SLAM tech system. Um, after you configure the locate, the precise locations and, and direction that the, uh, um, that the sensors are, uh, well, in this case, the, um, the, transdu this, the, uh, uh, the transducers are, are, are aimed at. Uh, so what this lets you do um, is it, uh, it lets the uh, SlamTech algorithm know, uh, have another way of knowing if something's in the way. And this is at a lower level than the LiDAR. The LiDAR is at the top. And this is like halfway down. So um, it feeds in and then the robot's able to avoid obstacle. It's an, uh, another obstacle avoidance um, method. And so let me, I got to share the other screen now. 
let me say share. Can I just here? Okay. So here's the video I want to show you uh, after I integrated. So in this, this is also, there's the bump sensors. This is the first one here is the bump sensor test. And I, I play a beep when it hits. So the bump sensors are the same idea. You, um, you describe their exact location on the robot and um, the, uh, that information gets fed up to the, uh, the slam tech uh, algorithms. And then uh, it, if the left bumper hits, then it knows it needs to go right. If the, if the right one, left and, and the center one it has to make a decision so in this case this is where the uh in this demo uh, the um uh the distance sensors are being used and it, it i had to adjust things so that the uh the robot would stop in time because it it, it can only it all based on sort of a certain radius of distance around the robot that's where the sonar kicks in or where it starts paying attention and then there's one more uh notice these uh, red cones that's the sonar representation in the uh the map on the robo studio software that comes with the slam tech and here you'll see, again, you can see that the, the obstacles below the LIDAR, that's the key point here. The LIDAR sees the rest of the room boundaries and uh, the uh, sonar sees that box. And I almost made it too low for this or too high, uh, yeah, not, too, not high enough. Yeah, so that's that's that. Um, uh, I guess I yeah, I, I should stop share. So um, uh, yeah, any questions? That's that's the I made this progress over a month ago about. It. So that was pretty impressive. You incorporated the uh, sonar into the Slam Tech uh, mapping. That was pretty good integration there. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. The is that someone? Oh, hold on a sec. I had a video playing, sorry. The, um, uh, let me get back, where's the, where did it go? I lost, oh. So, oh, there it is. So, um, yeah, the, uh, what I, I kind of got deep, more deeply into the, uh, the code base for um, the Slam Tech breakout board. And uh, you can develop, I mean, I, it's in C, it's in C or C++, and that's my main language anyway. So kind of, uh, I had to do a lot of work in there to adapt this code, or adapt the system to um, my particular motors and uh, controller board, as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The um, the feedback, uh, the, um, the location, or the uh, the feedback from the motors, the encoders, encoder feedback. So after doing that, then uh, it's really not that. It's reasonably sane looking code, and they there's a configuration tool that lets you uh, set the the locations of these sensors. And then things can just kind of worked. Now I did have some good documents online that uh, sh had sort of tutorial and some help. Uh, you just have to find them. They're difficult to find. And I use the tech support of Slam Tech and they responded uh, with help. So, and I, there's even 
more to do with it. I, I want to put the, uh, a depth sensor on. It supports depth sensors. And I have an old uh, Xbox 360 Connect. So I might as well try that on it. And, um, and there's a document about that. And there's a document about uh, using uh, Omni wheels, which I shared with Dr. Bruce. And he's very, um, excited about possibly uh, moving his slam tech over to the uh, to the three wheel Omnibot. And so it's, it, I'm glad that it's such an expansion, expandable system. Uh, and uh, I definitely recommend it. And then we, we also share, you, you know, we, we share code uh, with the, uh, across the AI SIG group, subgroup. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we ran kind of late today. So uh, I have one thing to show here. This is the current state of my uh, oh. iPad. So it has the new collar added, which will allow me to tighten down the neck piece so it'll stay there. Oh. And internally, I have added most of the wiring. And it's kind of messed up right now, but I added a 10 amp fuse to help protect things. And then here in the back, you can see this toggle switch. Well, what I had was I had a, I wanted to use a push on, push off switch, but the push on, push off switch was so fragile that when I tried to put it in there, the, the wires twisted it all, it broke. Could you lift that up just a little higher for the camera? Oh, uh, thank you, that's better. So it's kind of hard to see down in there, but uh, that's one of the problems is I made that space so tight that the uh, small little push on push off switches won't fit in there without breaking. Oh. So I found this uh, single pole double throw toggle switch that I had in my junk box and it fits in there just nicely. So that's what it's going to go with for now. <laughs> and well, it's like, it's, like it's getting there. It looks really cool. Looks good, Les. <laughs> hey, your camera works too. Yeah, your camera's working pretty good. And the uh, 10 amp fuse is just an automotive fuse that I bought and uh, a holder oh, wow. that I got at AutoZone to put it on. Nice. So it should all work. This wiring up here is for the batteries. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So that's uh, the batteries are inside these boxes here and they're actually just uh, 18650 batteries and these boxes have a friction fit cover that goes on so they'll stay in place and it snaps down and that was all printed on the uh, CR10S printer. I, what I did was I put a rail just inside the uh, perimeter of the box and then on the top of the rail I put a uh, cylinder and then along the wall of the box I put a slot so when you push it down it, the cylinder pops into the slot and holds it on. Oh, that's cool. I did all of that with, uh, what do you call it? Open SCAD. Uh, open, open SCAD. Yeah, it's good old open SCAD. <laughs> so, you can see it's gotten a little, little crowded down in there on the wiring where the uh, servos are going to go. I'm oh. not sure if that's all going to fit. I may have to rebuild that and open that space up some more. Looks <laughs> like it's really tight in there. It's really tight in there. And that's... Uh, at this point, all that's down there is the two uh, neck servos and the two shoulder servos. And that's all that has to come down from here. But there are 18 more servos that will be wired into there, including these two. And uh, that space is really tight. I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work for me. But it's, it's all in there, and it's all wired up. If I turn the power on right now, I get power to the processor. But while I was putting the card in today, I, I, when I had my motorcycle accident, I lost some of my sense of touch. And the, oh. the slot I made is so tight that I have to use needle nose to put the card, the SD card down in there. And without any sense of touch, I couldn't tell how much force I was applying. So I broke the SD card. So I've got to start over again with my software installed and all that stuff. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> miserable when it happens, but it happens. 
And that's also why it's taken me so long is every once in a while, I'll, my hands will cramp up or something and I can't get all the wiring done that I need to get done. And there's a lot of stuff in here, as you can tell. So at this point, I've got the uh, IMUs installed right there. And the down here is the power converter that takes the uh, eight volts out of the 18650s and converts it down to five volts to drive the other com electronic components. And then the uh, these servo boards and the display board that will go up here are driven from the 3.3 volts off of the uh, I. So I can see you're getting tired and I'm tired of talking, but you can see that I'm getting there. It's just taken me an awful long time. I, I thought I would have it walking by now. Uh, it looks good. <laughs> really good. Great. Yeah, it looks great. Oh, yeah, guys. Well, Thank you, Les. I think Thank I'm going to You guys have a good evening. You too. Okay, so uh, if there's any, there's any others? Well, I would you like can. to say one thing if I could, if it's okay. Yeah. I'm in the process of reorganizing my living room here so I can move some of my my two tables out from my room out into here so I can have more space in my room. So I will have in in my living room here my uh uh table that has my 3D printer on it and my other table I do my electronic work on so I work on it outside of my room. So it's gonna give me more space in my room. It's gonna be pretty cool looking. So right now I'm in the middle of cleaning up the living room so I can do that. <laughs> Oh, goodness. And, and, I, and I just finished insulating my garage. It was a <laughs> Well, one of the things I'm working on at work with, we're working with the Lynx Motion uh, serial servo, several, uh, servos is pretty interesting. They're fun to work with. Hold on a second here. Those are the 360 with feedback, right? Yeah, they're there. Yeah, the, from Lynx Motion, I'm working with it at work. Those, those are very cool. I've been waiting for those kind of servos for a long time. Yeah, uh, here, I'm in my living room. I'm gonna turn the camera around so I can show you where I'm, what's going on in here. And where are you working? Uh, it's the same company down in Irvine. This is my living room. I'm trying to, my bedroom's back there. Uh, what I'm trying to do is clear this area out over in here. So I can put two tables out here and I had a bunch of junk in here. I'm trying to get going. I'm a bit of a pack rat and it's hard to throw things away. Uh, but I'm trying to get this cleaned out to the point where I can move that some stuff out of the, the uh, my room, my other roommate said I could do it. So uh, that's what I'm doing. A little messy right now. I'm still trying to get stuff out of here. What are you doing for that company, Tim? Anything fun? Well, I'm getting, I'm getting to play with these uh, Adreno compatible boards that are a lot more powerful. Oh, cool. Like the uh, SparkFun black, Blackboard board and a couple other boards that basically have these Cortexa chips on it. And like the one board I have, it's got like uh, 48 I.O. pins to play with. And it also has a built-in Wi-Fi chip on there so you, you can uh, – do stuff with your onto your you put an app on your phone that can control things and stuff right, right one of the things we want to do where i'm working at is be able to control some things off the uh using the uh you know that type of app type of thing so i'm working toward that bit you're developing some new uh new hardware that needs some software stuff to control it with he's finally got the hardware together and I want to work on incorporating that stuff. So what I'm doing, I'm breadboarding up all the individual systems and trying them out one at a time. And then he's going to, once he decides which way the board's going to go, he'll spin a board to uh, put all of it on one board. And then fit so you're into doing it. prototyping, Tim? I'm sorry, Thomas? Are you doing prototyping? It's some, pro yeah, it's prototype. Basically, I'm building up uh, uh, little prototype things, and I'm basically messing with the, these chips on a breadboard uh, to, uh, you know, test out the software and stuff. That's and fun. Yeah, you know, I was having a problem with one chip. It, it it wouldn't let me download a one program I wanted to do. I wanted to control some. You wanted to control some NeoPixel LEDs. Uh, it was really frustrating because I was going right down a, a tutorial how to do it, and I get to the part where it downloads a program, and it go, 
it starts to compile, it gets down to this one line and stops it's saying, I can't, can't find that uh, thing to do it for it. And I, I had the library in there and everything. So they're, we're switching over to another board, which is a, uh, by SparkFun, it's the, uh, called, uh, the Blackboard. It has this little, little chip on it, basically, uh, with built-in radio Wi-Fi thing on it. So I'm starting to work with that. I didn't get very far on it today, but uh, been playing around with a nine axis uh, sensor chip. That's pretty cool. I squared C. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get all the subsystems to work outside of the unit. You know, like he wants to control servos. He wants to control NeoPixels. He wants to control uh, this motion sensor thing. So that's where I'm working on. This is just my first week, so that's where I'm at. Congratulations on the new job and good luck to you, Tim. Yeah, right now it's sort of fun. I get to play with some new new chips and new chips and little boards. These things that are are Adreno type compatible, but they've got these Cortexa stuff on it. It's really powerful. A lot of I/O pins, a lot of pulse width modulation, and all sorts of cool stuff. I have to tweak the Adreno IDE to be able to talk to these things. So uh, I'm working on it. All right. I was having problems with one chip, so I was trying to switch to this other board, and I haven't got too far into uh, getting it ready to work with the uh, Adreno. I'm just trying to get everything set up. Mm -hmm. Been having problems when I would try to find libraries and stuff. And, and one thing I was trying to find a library, and the library's not, not there anymore. So I don't know. I might have to see if the, I, I can. Uh, get a source for it and put it in manually or something. Mm -hmm. So they got a GitHub uh, thing. It's got the thing in there. So I haven't got too far into that yet, but working on it. Get to play with NeoPixels and all sorts of cool stuff. Plus I also bought for myself uh, a version of the these boards, another version of these boards, a similar type of thing, but it's, it serves up its own web page, basically. It's got a web server on a chip that you can Use the control things and working all right now to be able to control a couple of robots with that. Bought a couple of the boards uh, to duplicate something or someone just did it and I bought another one that has a little micro LED display on it. It's sort of cool. I haven't got into that yet, but I'm probably going to start getting into it in the next week or two here. So that's what I'm doing. Cool. What do you think, Tom? Tell us, I'd like to find out where that uh, you got that camera thing from. It looks pretty interesting. Um, online. Um, let me double check to see if I got it off of Amazon. I can't remember if I bought it directly or from Amazon. I think it was Amazon. You, yeah, Amazon. Get, Amazon. Send me a link. I'd like to look at it. I'll send it to you uh, privately. In the chat. Uh, can you Just see a, group chat? Yeah, I think someone posted the link. So it's yeah. dfrobot.com. They have it there. Yeah, it's right now I'm not near a computer. My computer is not turned on. I don't have it set up again. I can't use it. I'm just watching you guys. I'll post on it to the mailing list. I'm sorry, Thomas. I'll post it to the mailing. Why don't somebody else post it? Because I haven't got anybody online. Oh, yeah, I'll talk to you later about it then. Okay. Right. I'll post it. We'll post it to the uh, group. I think it was. Yeah. Well, again, actually. It yeah. Was post it to the mailing list again. Well, if I can't find it, I'll ask you, I'll ask you to email it to me later or something. You're on the mailing list, right, Tim? I'm sorry, Jim? You're on the uh, RSSC mailing list, right? I think so. I'm not sure, actually. Well, we can uh, mail it to you, too. Yeah. But if I, I'm not, I'll figure a way to get back, get on it. I don't know. I don't know if I'm still watching. Yeah. I haven't been getting anything from you guys, so I guess I'm not on it anymore. Okay, I can just add you because I'm the administrator. <laughs> okay, then add me, and I'll uh, I like to get a hold of that. From what you and Thomas described, it looked like it's a pretty powerful little thing, and the fact that it has it a built little display in the back is sort of cool. Yeah, and the price is pretty good, uh, and I think the price it's, is great. Yeah, you're right, Jim. I I I think it's a, maybe a step in the right direction, or better than the Givois, But I have I have one of those too, but I haven't I don't use it much. Well, this to me looks like it'd be easy to interface to other platforms. And I'm going to probably get more into this and I'm probably going to get a hold of a, uh, uh, that robot thing that you use, Thomas, uh, at some easy point. Easy robot? Yeah. 
I'm thinking about buying one of the uh, you know kits because yeah. the uh, dentistry lady's working with that too a little bit. Well, oh, I Tim. just made I made for her a uh, a Mars rover type robot, basically using PVC tubing and a uh, uh, board that has like a controller, like a, like a Game Boy controller or whatever that's, that's running. Uh, the board can run two uh, DC motors on it so i got it working in it we're pretty pretty works pretty cool climb over just about anything so she wanted me to part up electronics for her jim is this free chat i'm sorry ben jim yeah uh, yeah the... okay just want to make sure that was the where we were at on this okay i can, I can show okay. something real quick if you want oh yes yeah. what you got there walter something uh so Let's see. You guys showed it last time, but uh, you remember that guy, right? It's the uh, the IG11, that guy with the head. Yeah. He turns his head like that. Oh yeah. All right. So, so this right here. Let me turn that off. Let me turn on the other camera. Uh, I'm trying to find your screen here. <laughs> so this right here it's is that head being uh, i'm just building it right now oh boy you're but, printing, uh, you're printing yeah, like crazy printing there you. walter huh i said you're printing everything look at you yeah so i finally learned everything there is to know about neopixels and uh i think i got it down pretty good Sweet. So uh, I found this one's on Amazon, which I really like. They have the built-in chip and everything. Order like it it's, got, it's got a nice wire that you can easily cut. Oh, wow. Uh, and you can do individual ones, or you can control them all with a single line. And then I'm... Can you post I'm, that, Walter? Can you post the, that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post a link if you want. I'm diffusing yes, the light with an old, uh, it's like a folder separator thing <laughs> oh that's a good yeah. user that's anyway good so idea. because all the star wars lights are always diffused you never see every anything that is super bright uh, in star wars so so all the lights that i have are diffused i can change the uh the brightness on it and everything so what what boards are you using to control those with right now it's just an arduino uno actually okay yeah it's just an uno and um New Pixel Library is pretty cool. Yeah, I got the Adafruit. I uh, just tweaked it a little bit, but um, uh, Adafruit uh, Library seems to work pretty well. Uh, well, there's uh, uh, several uh, uh, New Pixel Libraries out there. There's one called Fast LED. It's the one, other one that you're talking about. Uh, you can do some pretty cool things with it. Yeah, yeah, I I like it. I I dig it. Um, took me a while to glue all these things in here. I was telling Alan that. Uh, so. That's now your idea. that I've got all this free time, I actually take a long time to do anything. So I would like glue one NeoPixel, come back the next day and glue another <laughs> NeoPixel. <laughs> like, oh pixel. boy, really, really you dragging it out, aren't you? Up, uh, I used to stay up all night and I could do it in one night. I would assemble the whole thing and have it ready by next, you know, not even go to sleep the whole night and just have it ready the next morning because I was so excited. But now it's like, I'll put one pick Neil pixel in. I'll come back the next morning and I'll put another one. <laughs> they give me forever now to build anything. <laughs> that's weird. I, I I don't understand why you're doing that, but that's sort of cool. Well, the the busier you are, I guess, the more you get into the mode. But then the more time you have, the more you're like, eh, I'll do it tomorrow. So. Yeah, drag it out a little bit. So that's the one you're gonna head. You're gonna animate and everything. Uh yeah, yeah. So I did finish one. I actually did finish one. I did another one. I don't think you guys saw it. Uh, let me. Uh, let me I just screen real quick. I uh, just got that respirator mask in the mail the other day, so I'm gonna start painting my other Yoda next week. I think. Yeah. Ah. So, I just finished uh, this guy. Oh, that's your smelter droid. Oh, that one's cool. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a little. It's a little guy from uh, the animated series. Uh, uh, shoot, what's it called? The, the Star Wars animated series. <laughs> yeah, Star Wars: The Clone Wars. 
The Clone Wars, yeah. So they had this little guy there. And uh, there's a guy in England that he he modeled it like in two days. Like the next day after it showed up, he modeled it. And so uh, I asked him for the files and he's like, oh, here you go. Give it a try. And he hadn't even printed it. So I printed it and I told him, you know, all the little defects that I found. And so he corrected them and all that. But this is a little bit of what it looks like. It's it looks like the head will be a little bit top heavy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the head is bigger than the whole body, by the way. But that's how it is in the animated series. It's printed in four parts. You can kind of see a little bit of the line. It's not perfect, but well, at least it's able to stand up on its own. That's sort of cool. Yeah, I'll I'll put some neopixels in. I'm neopixeling everything now. Kind of like bedazzle. <laughs> kind of kind of like bedazzle. You know how you bedazzle everything? I'm gonna neopixel everything. I want to neopixel everything. I see. Oh yeah. <laughs> Be able to show it off to the uh that's how you do it <laughs> there. 501st. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting neopixels on everything. I don't care. <laughs> you gonna put some uh, round neopixels in there or what? Oh, yeah. I, I got all kinds. I bought so many kinds to test. Oh, you went crazy, did you? I went crazy and tried every neopixel in existence. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I worked on that. Uh, uh, Magic wheelchair thing. I had a whole bunch of NeoPixels thing. We duplicated one of the floats, uh, Disney floats, up for a wheelchair. And I had a whole ton of NeoPixel strips in there. Yeah, yeah. And Carl, Carl has some great projects on his. Um, uh, that what is the website? The the way you teach people how to do things. Uh, Instructables, yeah. Instructables, yeah. So Carl is the the NeoPixel pro there. <laughs> He's I also playing with every <laughs> NeoPixel yeah, in cool. the world. Now I know where to go. <laughs> Yeah, oh, huh. and there's new form factors every month. You know, I just got the ones you had there. They're like fairy lights, so it's uh, thin silvery wires connecting them. It's like, man, it's like yes, they're great. Yeah, hey, Carl, post your uh, URL. I worked with the strips that have the uh, waterproofing and the backing on the back. Yeah, I like those because they're not surface mounted, and you know, I don't have to squint to solder every little wire. It's got some nice wires already there, so it's easier to solder. <laughs> But anyways, that's it for now. That's just the fun, something fun. Well, like I say, as soon as I get through with getting the Yoda pay, painted, I'm working on a uh, DJ Rex from Star uh, Galaxy's Edge next. Cool. I'm going to put some NeoPixels in there probably, make it a little bit more fancier than them. Oh, yeah, there you go. Carl posted the uh, Instructables. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and it adds, uh, you know, it adds another dimension to what you build. So, mm -hmm. definitely. yeah, and, and those digital ones. I mean, the NeoPixels, the WS twenty eight twelve B LEDs. The really cool thing, you know, plus five ground and one data line. You know? So yep. you can have any number of LEDs and a single data line. So they're super useful. Oh yeah, you go crazy with it. That's what I'm using. Yep. Yep. I mean, I had a strip that had over 120 LEDs in it. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you definitely have to watch out. There's some that don't have the chip built in, so you got to use something else to drive them and all those things. So, Yeah, the only thing I didn't like about these flexible ones or the waterproofing thing, it was hard to start with the wires on the one end. That's why I got the ones I got. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, I would highly recommend silicone wires, so because otherwise, the, you know, any kind of, like, solid core will tear the pads right off those strips. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Walter, I think you're going a little bit NeoPixel crazy there, but that's sort of cool. <laughs> yeah. Can't be too crazy with NeoPixels. That's right. Yeah, you look at Carl's projects. He puts it on, on I'm, everything. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna have to find the I'm gonna have to find the link to his site there so I can look at it. Well, it's down there on the chat. What chat? The chat for this uh, meeting. I'm not sure how to access that. Oh yeah, you're on your phone. Yeah. I'll email it to you. Uh, I'll, talk to you. I'll talk to you offline about it or something. Yeah. Cool. But that's pretty cool, Carl. You've been getting, uh, Walter, and that Carl's doing all this cool stuff, but you're going really crazy with the robot stuff, man. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's, just fun. it's just fun. Uh, you know, th this is just fun stuff. It's nothing super He's not crazy. It's, it's nothing super useful, but it's... Uh, 
you know, it's uh, it's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's creative. Yeah. It's a stress reliever. <laughs> I mean, I wish the barbershops were open. My hair is getting too long. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to build a robot that can cut your hair, Tim. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, that might be too dangerous there, Thomas. Didn't that one woman have a robot hair cutting, uh, build a robot hair cutter? What's her name? Um, the the uh, she, robot girl, what's her name? Simone Gertz, yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't she build a hair cutting robot? Yeah, but it, if, if she built one, yeah, you don't want to use it. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to use hers. <laughs> you guys ever see the movie? Potentially yeah, humorous. Yeah. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> yep. The hair cutting machine in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. was there? Oh, yeah, you're right. I remember that. Yeah, it's that one with Dick Van Dyke. He's an inventor. It smokes and cuts the guy's hair terribly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, I got to go feed the dog, actually. So. Uh oh, that can be dangerous. <laughs> Well, hey, this was a fun meeting. Thanks for, I almost forgot about it. <laughs> uh, I want to ask one thing. Uh, are the Riverside people, the Riverside Club people getting notices? Because several people said they didn't get a notice. Is it going to spam? How's that working? Uh, Linda and I are getting notices on Meetup. Okay. Um, good. All right. So you got the notice for this meeting. I was yeah. going to spam. Um, Robert I just said he didn't. Robert, are you here? I don't see Robert's name. I think he left. Yeah. Danny, are you getting our messages? Yeah. On Meetup. Okay. All right. Forrest, are you sending it out to the uh, San Bernardino Club? The link? Uh, yes, I, yes, I did. I, I, I saw the notice for this one just tonight when you texted me. All, all right. Okay, good. At least we know the message is getting out. Right, because uh, one of the members w was asking, uh, when are they having it? So I didn't have a good answer, so. It's the same link every week, right, uh, Alan? Alan. Alan, are you there? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, you're on mute. The Zoom That's master correct. tells you how to use Zoom and forgets to unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, well, yeah, we're, we're trying really hard to spam out the meeting invite across every you know, method that we have. So um, we uh, this time actually, I think Thomas, you sent out the one on Meetup, and then I got that going. Yep, yeah, and then Jim sent out the one through Google Groups this time, and then I posted the event on Facebook. All right, so we are getting the new word out, and it's the okay. same thing every month or week. So the same link every month, and it's always on the second Saturday and the fourth Saturday. Okay. I mean Friday. Friday, Friday. Friday. Oh, everyone. <laughs> Second Friday and fourth Friday every month. Second and fourth Friday every month. Okay, gotcha. All right, I'll remember that. Mark it down from my calendar. Sure. Thank Hello. you, Ben. Alan. Guys, ladies, the the um, the state's opening up. Anybody want to guess when we're going to get back to uh, in-person meetings? Not this oh, year. No. This year? This year? Maybe next year. Uh, Maybe next year. I, I don't want to go to a meeting until I get a, an inoculation. I, you know, if I don't have, if I'm not uh, safe with that disease, I don't want to come near a big group of people. Yeah. yeah. Well, the way I look at it, until they find a cure for this thing, I ain't going anywhere. I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. You got to stay safe. Father-in-law living with us, and he's a, he's about. I mean, I. Five. I'm. Uh oh, old, and I have an underlining. Uh, diabetes condition well, you stay away from people tim well i'm doing the best i can uh that's why i'm sort of isolating at work too a little bit mm. alan um just a brief request um i would <laughs> find the recordings of the previous meetings and um I guess I eventually found a link to one of the meetings and then I did a search for the RSSC and brought up a bunch of them. But is it possible to put a general link or whatever we need to do in order to get 
you know, access to the recordings of these meetings? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, on the on the RSSC site, posted a link to the playlist front and center on the site. Plus, on the RSSC messaging, um, will um, we've been including a link to the playlist as well. I can double check to see if it was included on the on the last invite on me. But whether it was or not, we'll make sure that's included moving forward. Well, are you talking about the last meeting, the last meetup? Um, well, the the uh, we sent out an email communication through Meetup about the meeting uh, tonight, and I can double check to see if the link to the playlist was included on it. And if it wasn't, I apologize. We'll make sure it's on the next okay. meeting. Okay. Okay. And when will this particular uh, Meetup's video be available then? Um. You know, give what? me a day or two to to download it and, and upload it. But I would, I'm going to upload it this weekend, whether I can get it done Saturday morning, Saturday evening, Sunday, I'm not sure yet, but okay. definitely this weekend. Yeah, I found the last one with Dr. Bruce's presentation to review that material was just uh, very, very helpful. To I picked up a lot of stuff that I didn't get during the meeting by reviewing that video. And uh, so... Um, I vote for keeping these videos going of these meetings. The technical stuff is just invaluable to us. Yeah, for sure. We've got a lot of smart guys and gals in our clubs. Definitely, yeah. Including yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy to be in good company. So, so look, we're about ready to wrap up. Um, I'm glad to see everyone is doing well and as healthy and as happy as we can be in certain circumstances. Um, on the club side, uh, Walter and I kind of have the inside track since we work for the campus. And what's going to happen is at some point they're going to allow any events to happen on campus, campus, which may occur before or after they let our students back in. But as that occurs, we'll kind of let you know how things are progressing. But as of right now, we could very well be being uh, virtual through the end of the year, for sure. Uh, what about member contributions? Uh, we used to pay a little bit every year. Well, the good thing is that we're paid up for the, for the entire year, so maybe uh, at the beginning of next year, I don't know how we're going to do it, but maybe by then we'll be doing live meetings, uh, hopefully. If not, we can, we'll continue to do using Zoom and uh, we can pay our dues when we meet. Yeah, for sure. We don't really have anything set up for alternative donations or public donations. Uh, the good news is our operating costs have gone down a lot over the past few months. So that's been working for us. <laughs> no refreshments to have to provide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. For sure. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great long holiday weekend, and we'll catch up in a couple of weeks. Bye -bye. All right. Bye. -bye. All right. Thanks, Bye. safe, everybody. Good day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you at the next meeting. Good night, Walter.